Hello everyone, I'm really happy that I'm here today and I'm really happy that you are here today. We will be talking about performance, my beloved topic. So I'm really happy that so many people is interested in performance. My name is Konrad Kokos, as I said, a single slide about me, I'm an author of this book, which is only 1000 pages about .NET memory management. It weighs two kilograms. I measure the quality of books in kilograms since I wrote this book. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of the initiative .netos, which is an initiative spreading knowledge about, knowledge about internals and uh, performance. And also, uh, currently, I'm involved into the development of the card game for .NET developers. How many of you like card games or are playing card games? If you are interested, I have prototype with me. We can play after the talk or during the break or uh, during the after party. So, that's about me. Uh, the, talk, the talk is about high-performance code design patterns in C-sharp. So, uh, the very first question is, what is high-performance in C-sharp? Whether we should even care about something like that? For me, it is very important. I'm a C-sharp developer for many years. I am involved in the .NET ecosystem and projects that are written in .NET. So, I really want to have a, this possibility to write high-performance code in C-sharp. <laughs> That's a fraud, fraud mistake. I was just going to say that I don't want to write in C++, <laughs> but instead in C Sharp, because we have such possibilities. And um, having, said that, having said that, this talk is not about uh, a, a general performance, like application performance monitoring. It's not about front-end or architecture scalability. It is not about caching, Redis, databases. I'm only talking about performance in terms of C Sharp code. Uh, on code level performance. And also not talking about trivial advices like do not uh, use, do not uh, avoid memory leak, for example, or do not use Linku or uh, such, such trivial advices. Everyone probably knows that we should avoid heavy things. This is about the low level code that we are trying to write in C sharp. This mistake will follow me the, all, the, all the talk. Okay, so I, when, as a person involved in the uh, high performance stuff uh, in ethnet ecosystem, I'm seeing some design patterns and I thought that it would be interesting to list some design patterns, what we can do to write high performance code in C Sharp. And all those design patterns that I'm listing here today is a kind of my own initiative to try to list those design patterns that we are using. A design pattern is important, I think, because uh, it is just a common solution to a very common problem. Like in our object-oriented programming, we have design patterns. So uh, here we will be having design patterns for uh, performance. Uh, for problems that occur in different contexts very frequently. Obviously, such design pattern contains uh, expertise, knowledge, uh, good practices, how to solve these problems. And also, uh, very important for us, it, avoid, it helps us to avoid uh, reinventing the well problem. We have such problem and we are trying to solve it while the solution already exists in the market. So let's just reuse this. And um, more importantly, such design patterns are based on more general fundamental principles, uh, exactly like the same is in the case of object-oriented programming. We have design patterns in object-oriented programming, but they are based on solid principles, clean codes principles, modularity, loose coupling, high cohesion, a lot of principles that are underlying the design patterns in object-oriented uh, programming. The same is for high performance. There are some principles about more fundamental principles about that, but this talk is only 50 minutes. I was trying to put those in the description of this fundamentals into this talk, but this talk then uh, took me two hours. I don't have so much time. So uh, there is a version of this talk which uh, contains all these principles and the link to it will be provided at the end of the presentation, so I invite you to look at the slides. Uh, but now I'm just skipping directly into the design patterns. Mm, the, 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 the spirit of these principles will follow us during all the description of those design patterns. So, exactly like the case in the object-oriented programming uh, design patterns, what is a design pattern? It contains a name, which is the name of the design pattern. Obviously, it contains uh, the so description of the problem that this uh, design pattern tries to solve, the solution, obviously. Uh, the benefits, what are the benefits of using this design pattern, besides the fact that it 
solves the main problem, and also whether there are some consequences, drawbacks, caveats of using this pattern. And the, with the, this structure, I'm trying to describe you some common patterns that I found the, in the market, that I found on the my, my own experience. So, design patterns. Uh, I th this will be just a list of design patterns, not the comprehensive one, because again, it, the talk could, took, uh, could take two hours if I would try to describe the all. I'm describing some most typical one. The very first pattern, and the na names are my, by my own, so this is a name that I just chosen, the frugal object, which is a pattern trying to solve the problem that we need to store efficiently set of uh, data, uh, set of data that they can take various forms. And the very typical uh, problem here will be that we need to represent a collection. A collection that is, uh, has, can have zero elements, one element, two elements, or more elements. This is a very typical thing. But how we can store it more efficiently than this just simple collection? We can do it. In the, form of in the kind of form of discriminated union. And maybe the description is not the most uh, clear here, so the example probably will be the best way to describe it. This is a, a, a exactly the, uh, this pattern applied in ASP.NET Core uh, uh, code base, which is a type called string values, and this is a type which is storing zero, one, or many strings. And instead of just of using list or array, we are having here a field, which is an object. And this is uh, beneficial for us because this is um, designed for a case when most typically this collection contains zero or one element. So in such case, we can just store this simple single string into this type instead of using an array which will contain a single element. This may be quite, uh, quite counterintuitive and quite strange, but uh, this makes this more, uh, it makes it with da better data locality because we don't have, we have one less reference to follow. We will just have this single string into this type uh, instead of having uh, the array. Obviously, if we, have, uh, we want to store more elements than uh, one, we will be just using the array uh, underneath. So it is kind of quite in counterintuitive way of solving this problem. But as always in fast performance code, it is all, 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 all the code which is fast is ugly. Sorry for that. Uh, and as Dmitry Ivanov said recently on Twitter, most uh, code bases that take care of performance will have such kind of collection that is tuned to have only one element, for example, or two elements, because most typically we know, for example, that in case of our application, our collection most typically contains zero, one, or two elements. And he provided also nice examples of this pattern, like for example, in JetBrains code base, they are using a compact list, which is a list designed for having typically only one element. And if there is more elements, they are just storing it into the real array, a little list. Quite strange, but still it is beneficial for the case that we have only single element. Or for two elements, a uh, code base also from JetBrains, a list that typically contains no more than two elements. So this is a kind of quite strange pattern. Feel, feel invited to in the .NET performance world. We have strange patterns here, and this is like that. If you have any questions about that, I have to speed because I have some more patterns to say. I strongly invite you to come after the talk, ask me questions if you have any doubts why this is beneficial or, or so. Uh, so this is a frugal object. We are trying to have object uh, designed for a specific case like having a um, small number of elements in a collection. Obviously, this makes uh, also this uh, another benefit of it is that JIT can be uh, have better opportunity to tune the code because for a single element, the access to this element will be much faster than accessing this array. So there are benefits from many from many uh, perspectives. Obviously, there is a consequence: the API becomes a little bit uh, more complex because instead of using simple list or array, we are using we are using some strange type now, and also. So uh, the code becomes a little bit uglier, but this is a, as always in case of uh, performance. So this was the very first pattern just to warm up you. Now the second pattern, pooling. Uh, pooling is a tremendously popular way now of how we can solve and speed up uh, C-sharp code. 
Uh, the problem that we are trying to solve is that we have create we are creating a lot of temporary data, a lot of create a lot of objects which is which we create very often. Uh, the cost of it might be direct, like the cost of the allocation of the object, or the indirect, like we are introducing fragmentation because of creating many objects and then delete, deleting them. So the solution is uh, by the idea quite easy. Instead of creating every time we need an object, uh, create an object. We instead of that we are just reusing some objects from a pool. And tremendously popular way of solving this currently in a .NET is a array pool. Have any of you used array pool? So this is, a, as you see, quite, um, quite easy to use uh, approach. Instead of creating an array, we are just renting such an array from a pool. We are consuming it somehow, and then we are returning this uh, uh, pool, this array to a pool. So. Uh, quite easy from the perspective of the API, but it provides a very, very big uh, performance benefit. This uh, is a description of the shared instance. It has some predefined sizes of arrays, and the predefined number of the arrays of in such of those uh, buckets of different sizes. This is our implementation detail. For us, it is most important that instead of creating an array every time we need some array, we are just renting it, using and returning. So let's imagine a very simple uh, case. We have some, we have some uh, method with that we would like to benchmark with benchmark.net. And this is like it contains with two stages. It contains some list it, uh, items, which is a field of some, uh, which is a just let's treat it as an input. We need to pre-process the input and send it further to some process batch method. So we need this temporary array, temporary collection to represent our pre-processed data. It doesn't matter what the processing look like here. It is just an example. The most important thing for us is that we just need for some time a temporary collection to be passed to a further API, maybe to call a REST API or something. So this is a method from which we are starting. We are just creating an array every time we need some array. And the result is like that. It, for now, we don't know it, whether it is fast or not. It is as just our baseline. We can very simply change that to using array pool. Now, we, instead of newing up new array, we are just renting them. Uh, uh, consuming by populating data, then uh, make uh, processing, and uh, after, af after everything, we are returning it to the pool. And as we see, the solution is quite easy. API doesn't cha didn't change a lot, but the result is quite important for us, because now uh, the code is almost twice faster, just because we are omitting the, the, the issue of creating an array. And moreover, as you can see on the allocated column, we are just almost no allocating anything because we are just reusing the same arrays every time we need the array. There is only 40, 32 bytes allocated as for some enumerator here, but the array itself is not being allocated. And in this very first version, we allocated four kilobytes per each method, so it was quite big. We tremendously reduced the number of allocations here. And so the pooling will be a very popular way of solving many issues, uh, performance issues in .NET. There is an abstract memory pool, with a, which is a, represents a pool of memory, and it con may contain various implementation. An array pool is a kind of this uh, a memory pool. Also, you can look for a slab memory pool, which is a, a memory pool used by the Kestrel hosting. And the question arises whether it is beneficial to make a pool for objects, for individual objects. I like strings, or maybe your customer class, or anything you use. So most necessary it is not necessary, most, most often it is not necessary because the cost of handling the pool will, ov over, uh, will outweigh the benefits of the pooling itself. So we should be really careful, uh, careful with the pooling small objects. Pooling a lot of a lot a big objects is beneficial because we get rid of the cost of initialization and allocation of the big objects. But for small objects, we should be really thinking twice whether it will be good for us or not. But there is, for example, you can copy paste object pool code from Roslyn codebase and use it because there is currently no public API for object pooling in .NET. 
and there was an issue which was to do such thing, but unfortunately, unfortunately it was closed. So uh, maybe in the future there will be such API provided. Okay, so it is a pooling. You should remember that uh, pooling is one of the best solutions to uh, reduce the GC overhead, to reduce allocations, to provide better data locality, which is a very important principle that we need to operate on the same memory again and again because the cache of the CPU, for example, will be populated with this data. So when we are reusing the same objects again and again, it is very beneficial from the performance perspective because they are cached in the, the CPU. There are some caveats, like for example, trimming strategy may be not trivial, when to trim this pool, uh, when to reduce the number of arrays from the, in this pool, the, the, the question does, doesn't have any trivial answers. And also the API becomes a little bit more complex because now we are just using the kind of manual memory management because we need to remember that we are re uh, renting a, an array and then we have to remember that we need to return it because we, without returning it to, uh, to the pool it doesn't make sense. So it creates a little bit more complex um, way of handling memory, but the benefits are huge. Okay. Third pattern, because the time is ticking, so we need to move along. The zero copy uh, design, which I'm calling like that because this is all about uh, avoiding coping, in fact, coping memory, which is a very costly operation. Every memory copy is a cost for our application and the performance hit. So the zero copy design pattern will be all, all around requiring uh, using sub data, like for example, substring. When you have a string and you are using substring method, this is just creating a new string with the content of the part of the original string. So we are just creating a new string and copying memory from the string into this smaller string. This is a completely uh, complete disaster in terms of performance, obviously, this old coping. The same with if you would like to create kind of subarray or sublist. All this creates a, 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 a makes a memory coping, so it is very, very bad. And the solution here in .NET is also tremendously popular. We introduce some special type of kind, special kind of type, uh, which provides slicing capability. And here our beloved span of T comes. Have any of you used so far span of T? This is a really, really powerful thing. And in terms of performance, this is the most popular thing of, uh, and every highly performance code will contain span of T in this or other way uh, being used. So span of T is kind of very, in fact, simple type. It contains so-called manage pointer and a length. And thanks to that, span of T is saying that I'm representing a memory from this place with a given length. So it is just kind of representing memory from some place to other place. Very simple idea. But it can provides very powerful capabilities because of that. Because now we can slice memory just by operating on the span of T. If we have this kind of, this uh, such amount of memory represented by span, we can slice it to smaller part of memory just base because we are now saying that the, it points to this place with given length, only operating on the manage pointer and the length itself. And moreover, beloved span can represent a lot, lot of various types of data. It can represent in, uh, regular arrays. It can represent stack allocated data that I will be describing um, later. It can represent unmanaged memory. In fact, it can represent any pointer, uh, so you can be uh, helpful with uh, talking when we are talking with unmanaged code. Uh, also, it can represent strings. And no matter what type of memory the current span is being uh, um, is representing, we always can use slicing. So we can slice arrays, we can slice uh, stack allocated data, we can slice strings, and all this will happen without coping memory. This is just creating a span that is representing a smaller part of the memory of the original memory. So it is very, very 
tremendously popular, for example, in parsing. The whole Kestrel hosting is based on span, because what is parser doing? Parsers are mostly descendant, in that way that we have some strings, and then we need to interpret the smaller part of the string, the smaller part of the string, and so and so on. We are interpreting the smallest and smallest part of the original string. Or like in Kestrel, when TCP data provides us strings, we need to parse it for uh, to find the uh, lines of the HTTP protocol, and then we need to interpret the specific lines of HTTP protocol to get the verb, to get the URL, to get the header, to get the value of the header. So every time we need to interpret the smaller part of something, span of T will be very, very beneficial for us, for parsers especially. And there is only one caveat uh, related to span. Span is, is a special type. As I said, it contains managed pointers. So uh, because of that, it cannot appear on the managed heap in any way because it will just crash the runtime. Uh, so we have this guarantee that the span of T will be never boxed. And the problem is that it contradicts the usage of async, because async underneath is using so-called state machines. The state machines can be boxed. They can live in the managed heap. So in other words, we just cannot merge the async and span. If we have an async method, it cannot be using a span as argument or a local variable. Yeah, it, it, it will just simply not compile, because it is prohibited. And here on this small, very fast solution to that problem, there is a more general memory of T type that we can also meet when talking about performance. Memory of T is kind of, um, let's say, brother of the uh, span of T, which is a little bit less flexible because it can represent only strings on arrays. Uh, but the most benefit for that when using memory of T is that it can be living on managed heap. It can be used, in fact, on every uh, normal C sharp code, including async. So we will be also meeting very often such pattern that there is an async method that uh, accepts memory of T, and then you can fool somehow a C sharp compiler just by using a span of T into the synchronous part of this async method. We are just somehow operating and folding that. We now can split uh, the, the processing from async part to synchronous part, and the synchronous part can use span. But yeah, this is the idea behind it. And for example, if you will find uh, currently in .NET C uh, 3.0, there are pipelines introduced, which are all about zero coping. This is a pipeline, which is a kind of type which produces, which in, pro, in introduces a way of uh, producer-consumer uh, communication or writer-reader. And this is all about zero coping. There will be a lot of spans here because it's all buffered and both reader and writer can look at the buffers via spans, by the zero copy approach. So everything is about span here. And also ref returning and in general refs that I will not be describing here. The also ref returning slide is in this bigger version of the talk that I'm just linking at the end of the presentation. So, zero, I really invite you to look at SPAN. This is a future of C-sharp high-performance programming, the king. Uh, everyone is using it because of this capability of slicing. Obviously, uh, this is a very beneficial, there is only one caveat that I'm seeing, that f from now in high-performance code, instead of using strings or arrays, we are just starting to use this very strange type, which is uh, a span or memory, which so API becomes a little bit less clear, because we are now using these very specific types instead of uh, the generic ones. Okay. The fourth one, uh, struct of arrays, is a uh, also kind of producing, uh, so it's solving a problem when we have to process a lot of data. When you have a, we have a lot of data to be pro processed, and uh, you want to lay out uh, somehow the memory that in a way that will be efficient for the processor simply, because uh, in a normal way we just don't care about it. And the solution will be just that, just that special type of uh, data organization which is called struct of arrays. Uh, this struct here in the name doesn't mean the struct in C-sharp. It is a struct uh, which we can understand just as a type. So it may be a class, it may be a struct, it doesn't matter. This is, we can translate it as a type of arrays. What does it mean, in fact? 
if you would be designing a normal processing of data, it will probably look like that. It is a well-designed, let's say, well-designed uh, object-oriented uh, code. So we have customer class, which encapsulates all the fields. Uh, there is only public method operating all those fields. There is a repository which contains all the li list of all customers. And we are just having this very important for us update scoring algorithm that is just processing customer by customer. Uh, ev every customer is being processed one by one. Ob obviously, this looks nice from the, it is clean and everyone understands it in terms of uh, design. But in terms of uh, memory performance uh, access, it is a complete disaster because, in fact, what we have here is a lot of references to references. For example, list of t is just uh, uh, internally has just a storage as, uh, in the form of array of t. So we will have a reference to our array of customers, and then this array of customers is just a list, um, an array of references to customers. And these customers are also a separate objects into the memory. We don't have any guarantees how those uh, customers are laid out in memory completely. So when we will be traveling, uh, we will be iterating those customers one by one, we will be just jumping, in fact, be in between various memory regions, like in a random way which is a complete, complete waste of a memory access. We don't need and we don't want random memory access because nothing can be cached, nothing can be in, taken and uh, read in advance. Random memory access is just an evil. And moreover, when the processor accesses memory, uh, it does it in so-called cache line. A uh, cache line is 64 bytes. So even if you ask for a single byte, the whole cache line is always read from memory. So even if you are asking for a single byte or two bytes, the whole 64 bytes will be read uh, from the memory uh, into the cache. So we really, really want to have this, uh, this such design that when we are reading some cache lines, we will read every important data for us. And this is not the case here because the customer object has some fields. The uh, fields have some automatic layout. We completely doesn't, uh, here completely doesn't have any control in what order, in fact, those fields will be in the memory. And in fact, we can be sure that the access will be not optimal. Customer object has some fields, but we are using in our algorithms only some fields. So we are just waiting memory because we are reading cache lines, uh, reading some fields from the customer, but the rest of the fields is not interesting for us. So we are just wasted some memory access. How we can solve it? The very, so, benchmark, some baseline that we don't know whether it is fast or no currently. We, it is uh, some number with the result. Uh, we can fix it in a simple way by having the, taking advantage of a struct better, better data locality because now I changed the class to a struct. Struct are not very popular because we are a, they are a little bit tricky. We don't want to use them because we don't we are not sure whether it is good or not. For this case, for me, it is good because I have a struct. I'm I'm using here sequential uh, layout, so I'm explicitly saying in what direction, in what order though those fields should be laid out in memory when representing such a struct. And moreover, the list now contains the customer values, so it contains structs. Uh, and this is a beneficial because in case of .NET implementation, it means that the values of those structs will be inlined into the array that is inside this list. And so instead of having references to customers spread around all the memory, we have inlined all the customers into this array. So it is much better for in terms of performance because we will be reading this sequentially. And sequential access is really, really good for CPU, for operating system, for every caching mechanism. What is the difference? The difference is like that. The code becomes quite fast. We can say that it is twice faster, almost twice faster, like just by replacing this object and the class to a struct. So it is better, but it is all about array of structs. And this is, this is our starting point. Array of structs is, is a kind of anti-pattern. What I'm describing here is a structs of arrays pattern. This is an inverse of this, which looks like that. 
And this is very ugly, I agree. This is violating every good uh, design pattern, uh, object-oriented design patterns. I just get rid of customer entity completely. I have no customer. I currently have struct of arrays, which means I have a structure which, represent, uh, which contains arrays representing the fields of all customers. This is ugly. But this is really good for performance. Why? Because now every uh, argument is in a separate array. And when I'm accessing those uh, arguments, those fields that are interesting for me, it will be read completely sequentially. And moreover, every cache line will read, uh, read, we read, read every interesting attribute for me. Because I'm just interested in scoring, earnings, smoking, and so on. So every this table contains those attributes, and every cache line contains all data. I'm not wasting any single byte when accessing memory here. The difference in performance is 10 times faster than the original one, just because I'm completely redesigned the way how those data is uh, represented. And obviously, I, didn't I don't want that you will leave now with the feeling that now you, ca you have to change every mm, design in your code from this good object-oriented design into the uh, plain arrays. But you have those small parts of your applications when you, the high performance is really important. This is the place when you can think about making such changes. 10 times faster for me, it's quite a big benefit. And uh, there is so-called entity component system. Uh, anyone in game dev, especially in game development, uh, uh, involved uh, mm, will recognize it because it is a very popular uh, pattern in game development. I invite you to read. I'm ha also having some slides, more slides about entity component system uh, in those bigger version. Uh, and uh, this is very popular. Uh, solution which is are built around this concept of struct of arrays. So as you see, this is a very ugly again anti -pat uh, pattern, sorry, which uh, provides us much much better access memory access performance. Obviously, the main trade of is here that we are just created a much worse design, which is completely not object oriented. But again, it can be beneficial on those smart parts of our application. Okay, another thing, and without any better name, I'm calling it simply stack-based data. Maybe you will have some better name for this design pattern. It is uh, about using, in fact, stack, because this is uh, another tremendously popular way how we write high-performance code now in C-sharp. The problem that we are trying to solve here is that we are allocating a lot of small temporary objects, uh, which obviously put a lot of high pressure on the GC because we need to allocate them, we need them to cl clean them, so this is not very good from the performance perspective. And how we can solve it when the most simplest way just not to allocate on the managed heap? And there we, we, in C Sharp, we have various possibilities to do that. Obviously, we have structs which are in, we, we, with us in C Sharp from the very beginning of the C Sharp, but we are, so they provide good data locality. There is no metadata, there is no object header, so they are more packed. Uh, and even JIT can enregister them, so they can be uh, living on the stack, but they can also be enregistered, which means the JIT will put the data of the struct into the registers of the CPU, so it will be even faster. But unfortunately, it can be boxed, and the scenarios in which the structures become boxed are so complex that I'm not even aware of every of them, probably. And we are just, the, the using of structs is a little bit tricky, so we are a little bit afraid of using them. Still Still, there are uh, some popular uh, structs uh, recently introduced, like value tuple, which represents a, mm, um, a tuple, tuple but as a struct, or value task, which is a task but is a, a structure. Uh, also, interesting things to find out, but those are obvious things for, uh, let's say, a little bit obvious things. There is also more advanced stuff that I would like to present you, like stack OLAC operator. Ref structs, I will be not talking about them. There, is a, there are some slides into the bigger version of this presentation and fixed size buffers. So, stack allocated. After the span, it is my second beloved uh, finding in the C sharp. Have ever of you used stack alloc? 
I will give you a price, but I don't have any. <laughs> uh, maybe two or three hands. This is a uh, operator that allows you to uh, alloc memory on the stack directly, because normally we are allocating on the managed heap, the GC is taking care of this object, and so on and so on. But on the other hand, we have stack, which is uh, just a small stack frame when the method is called, the stack frame is being created, there are local variables, everything is out of the box. But we have this powerful possibility to stack allocate directly kind of array into the stack frame. So all this data that we are stack allocating will be just into the stack, uh, making the stack frame a little bit bigger. And uh, from the very beginning, this operator has been uh, available, but it was not so popular. Uh, for example, the result of the stack alloc is a pointer. So to use stack alloc for many years, we need to use unsafe code. But then, uh, since the C-sharp 7.0, there is a span which represents, uh, which represents uh, also can represent result of the stack alloc, as we saw, saw before, so now the code can be safe. Uh, in terms that sometimes we can't deploy unsafe code, for example, on some Azure deployments, uh, but now we can use its span uh, and we can use its stack alloc safely. And unfortunately, there is one really big risk when using stack alloc. We completely don't have any control whether it will kill our application or not. Because when uh, stack allocating, we are just using the stack. The stack has its own limit of the size, and we can be just hitting stack overflow exception. And the stack overflow exception is one of those two, in fact, um, exceptions in .NET which cannot be catched. So by throwing it, we are just killing our application. Kind of big risk for me, but still, but because of that, we should be really careful how big uh, how big buffers we are stack allocating. The size should be small, and there is no official what uh, meaning of the small in such case. Even Microsoft is not sure. It is saying it should be like less than one kilobyte, for example. One le less than one kilobyte is okay. So. Coming to our benchmark, we have been using uh, an array, then we changed that to using an array pool, but now my peer processing and uh, intermediate uh, collection is represented just by a stack allocated data, which is just very simple change also, because now I'm using stack alloc, I'm uh, having some data struct which is uh, into in, in, uh, represented in this array, stack allocated array and populating data and then using him in the folder API. The result of the benchmark is nice for me because it is, uh, let's say, uh, even further, over 30% faster than the version with the array pool. Moreover, I have completely no allocations, again, because I'm just using stack for everything, so there is no GC overhead, any GC overhead. And you will met a lot of articles recently, a lot of libraries that are just reducing allocations just because of using stack more and more. Parsers, uh, various network stacks, or so on, so on, will just be using stack more and more with the help of stack alloc. Um, here currently the most cost is because we are zeroing this stack. The runtime provides this guarantee that we need to zero the stack memory because we are accessing the stack. We have this, the runtime provides this guarantee that when we are accessing the stack, all the memory is being zeroed. And this is not good for us. I don't want to zero memory because as we are seeing, I'm just stack allocating some buffer and then I'm just filling the, the, this buffer with data. So why do I need zero allocating, zeroing this memory? I don't need zeroing this memory. And we can do, probably do that. Uh, with the help of such locals init attribute sets to false, we are link going really deep here now, because we are saying that we are using stack, but we don't want to zero memory of the stack. I don't need zeroing memory of the stack, because I will be just using this stack, writing with data. I don't care what, this, what was there before. Uh, unfortunately, so we would like to have such locals in it um, attribute. The result will be even better. The code becomes faster again, because uh, we don't need, you don't have this uh, overhead of zeroing this memory. So it is the fastest possible uh, solution to this problem, as far as I know currently. And this attribute doesn't exist in .NET. 
but it exists in a 4D. I, I'm not sure if you are aware of such a code weaver. It is a, a library 4D, which allows you to manipulate the code uh, on the intermediate language uh, level. This is 4D uh, library. And there is a plugin, locals init 4D, which allows you to add this attribute for a particular method. And with the help of this attribute, the IL will be manipulated in a way that shows I don't want to zero my memory in this method. So it is possible. But there is an ongoing process of adding such attribute also to the .NET itself, to the C Sharp itself. Also, fixed size buffers. Uh, when we have, we, we want to have big data, but good data locality. We have a struct, and struct will be on the stack probably, but still we have we need some kind of array. And here we have array in a struct, but this array is just a reference to an array that will be allocated somewhere on the stack. So for us, this is still, still not everything on the stack. We can use fixed size buffers. This is also quite old thing, but recently used more and more. So it allows us to inline an array into a struct. And if this struct will be on the stack, the whole array also will be on the stack. So it looks like that. In case of struct, regular struct, which the regular reference to an array, we will have a struct with a, with a reference to an array. For from memory perspective, it is not so good because then we will need to follow this reference to some place on the GC heap. But in case of uh, fixed size buffers, everything is in place. We have in place this array, we have all other fields, everything is packed and dense. This can be very useful in case of talking with unmanaged API, for example, and also you can find such examples in CoreFix library because here uh, we are inlining our buffer which will be provided to when calling uh, unmanaged code. A uh, very nice thing to do and very nice optimization. Uh, moreover, this could be even not pinned because this lives in Riftstruct. A lot of different possibilities here is in terms of performance. For us, it is important that you can remember that you can provide this much better data locality with the help of fixed size buffers. If, and they will live also on the stack. So, stack-based data, embracing using the stack, avoiding using GC, this is the most important uh, solution now when designing high-performance code. Obviously, we have only one, one very small caveat of stack overflow exception and possibility of killing our app. But we, when, dying, when doing wisely, this should be safe for us. When we are operating on small buffers, everything should be okay. Uh, the last one uh, pattern I would like to describe is called buffered builder because it is also very often uh, uh, we can meet it very often in high performance code and the problem that we are trying to solve here is to that we generate a lot of temporary data because we operate on our immutable data. Like string. String is immutable. When we are adding something to string, in fact, we are creating new string with the uh, bigger content. Uh, so we need some kind of builder that will help us to manipulate this immutable data in a mutable way, let's say. And the ultra popular example here will be a string builder, which is uh, available in .NET from every time I remember. Uh, string builder is the solution, uh, the typical solution here. So I just created a very simple example to show you the difference. We have uh, two actions in our controller. The left controller is a um, disaster in terms of performance because it creates a lot, a lot of temporary strings. Every line is just using string concatenation, which means that we are just creating a new temporary string that will be replaced just in the second line and so on and so on. The, the right, left side is a string builder. Exactly the same code, uh, exactly the same result, producing some XML, exactly the same logic, in fact. The difference is that it is using string builder. And the difference is that it is buffered builder. So in case of string concatenation, we are just creating a lot of those temporary data. In case of string builder, we are just operating on the internal buffer, which just doesn't care. The DC doesn't care for many time because for a long of time because we are just operating on pre-allocated buffer, adding some data into this buffer. 
And the solution is, uh, this is in Polish, maybe you will understand some words, uh, but uh, the difference from the load, less lo load test looks like that. On the left side, there is a load test with the string concatenation, and this orange line, let's say, or yellow, depends uh, how you see the colors. I don't know the colors, so it's, let's say it is orange. Uh, it, uh, we can see that it, um, average percent in GC time is uh, the average is like 70 percent. So 70 percent of the process is consumed by the GC because we are allocating so many temporary data, temporary strings, we just need to take care of them. And in case of the right side, this is the result for when we are using String Builder, the overhead of GC will be at the level of 10% in average. So we have a huge difference of the overhead of the GC. Moreover, from the perspective of the customer, also the difference is huge. Like in case of uh, string concatenation, we, during the load test, I was able, able to process, let's say, 10, 9, 10 requests per second. And just because I choose it, uh, change it to use uh, a string builder, uh, I was able to make the improvement and process 150 requests per second, just because I've just get rid of this overhead of GC by reducing the number of allocations, by reducing the operations on the immutable data. data. And you will find also, probably in the future, more and more such approach. String Builder is all the tremendously popular uh, example, but there will be more in future, probably. Like, for example, big integer type, which is also immutable. It presents uh, a the integer with uh, any possible size. Um, so there is no max value for big integer, but it is immutable. When we are adding, uh, dividing big integers, we are just generating more and more temporary big integers. So there is a proposal for creating big integer builder with the operations like add, divide, multiply, and then only after doing all those operations into some, on some internal buffer, we will just be calling to big integer method and have this resulting integer, big integer. And here is also an example of a value string builder, my proposal of doing something on the stack. I don't have time for describing everything here, but what is important for us is that it is ref struct, which means it's a special new type of struct, which has this guarantee that will be always on the stack. It will be never boxed, it will never happen on the managed heap. So we have, a, we have this uh, benefit of this, it will be always on the stack. It, we have an uh, initial buffer here provided. The uh, value string builder accepts an initial buffer as a span. I will uh, just uh, uh, explain why in a few slides. And this, is, uh, this has very similar API to a regular string builder. What is important for us here is that the API of using it looks like that exactly like in case of string builder but the tremendously popular uh, solution currently is that such buff uh, such builders accept um, into, into those initial buffers uh, uh, in a constructor. And thanks to that, we can stack alloc buffer in our method and populate this builder with our stack allocated buffer. So it is very fast because all this code, in fact, allocates nothing until we, have we call this unfortunate two-string method, which means we need this uh, resulting string in the end, but all the lines do not allocate anything. We are just operating on the stack allocated uh, buffer initially. The difference in the performance is not kicking our asses, let's say, but the difference in um, allocations is uh, quite big. It, uh, we have just reduced the number of allocations by the um, four times less allocations we, uh, we are he having here. So it is good. If you will be using such string builder, uh, tremendously um, popular hot pass of our application, we will just reduce the number of allocations by the four. And so it is uh, really, really good for us. Such builders will be popular, especially when using stack allocated data. Everything is about using and uh, about avoiding GC. Uh, obviously, the API is much more complex now. We have to think about those builders, stack allocated data. All this has its own overhead. But this is the world we are living in case of .NET performance. 
There are also other patterns that didn't fit into this presentation. I have one minute left probably, so it is the perfect time to say that there I'm also seeing other patterns like lightweight wrappers for memory, like metaprogramming which allows us to avoid virtual calls, and obviously such popular things like caching, batching, and using SIMD for uh, vectorizing operations on CPU. Those are the slides that would fit the second uh, hour of this talk. Uh, some of them are described in this uh, in these slides. This is the uh, version of this presentation that I'm referring. I was referring to before. It is a longer version, so it is, has this long version, a long pro postfix because it contains some principles and a little bit more detailed description of those patterns that I was just describing now. Okay, it seems that is all. Thank you. And now we yeah. have five minutes for questions. Great. There is one. Uh, thank you for your talk. So you have mentioned that you cannot store span of T on heap, so it cannot be a member of a class. Yes. And for example, if I have uh, some application that has heavy interop with native code, and uh, I want to implement uh, a pullet array that will uh, give me chunks of uh, native memory, but I want to wrap it in safe context. So like uh, there will be a huge buffer and I will say that you can rent this piece from 8 to 16, but I want to do it in a safe context. Is it possible? Yes. You can use span of T or memory of T this context. I believe yes. I, as far as I understand your question, it seems completely doable with the span. But but uh, can this uh, you mentioned memory of T uh, can only contain uh, .NET arrays? I mean managed. It was a little bit uh, a simplification. It has only a possibility to represent something which is unmanaged, and then you have to do some a little bit more pl more plumbings, uh, define some memory pool uh, type. But it is possible. Mm -hmm. If you would like, I will co just contact me and I will provide you some details. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Conrad, for your presentation. And I have a kind of philosophical question uh, regarding uh, these uh, optimizations. Uh, so, uh, is there any point when uh, we should stop optimizing .NET code and just uh, write a, a nice .NET compatible C++ library? Ah, yes, yes, yes. I was expecting this question. I have even a slide about that. <laughs> <laughs> This is always happening that the question arises, what's the point? I mean, the point is for me very far because I understand, uh, I believe we can write a really efficient code in C Sharp still. And the question for me is, I, I have a company, I have a, .NET, I a lot of .NET developers, I have C Sharp developers, people with no C Sharp, with no old the, the .NET ecosystem. Obviously, I can go uh, and write something in C, C++, then, but then I need to hire some C, C++ developer. And for only for this simple, small part of the my application, I probably need to do such strange things, then I need to plug it uh, with the interop. For me, my, it is much better to have it in C Sharp, which is really as efficient as C++ and can be, uh, instead of just going to the, that direction. So uh, those four answers, three answers here, described it in a, in a uh, consistent way. For me, it's just much better to have this possibility to write in C Sharp than just find the solution in C++. And I invite you to find this project, ICSI. It is a very interesting academical project. It's, uh, the, they wrote uh, network drivers, which are working in user space in very, in very different languages, including C Sharp, Java, JavaScript. Um, Rust and C++, and they showed that the C Sharp version is all almost identically fast as a C++ code. So it is, they, they contain a lot of very interesting material to read regarding your uh, question also. Uh, I just want to ask about uh, struct usage. Uh, 
so maybe we just too obsessed with classes and uh, typically <laughs> use them uh, because you only told, told us that struct is uh, optimization but uh, yeah. as a useful in a typical code, I mean, not just for small objects. Yes, uh, this is interesting question. When is the point uh, when, when we should think about changing use of classes to structs, and whether this is maybe it is just good to replace all class to struct in our uh, source code. <laughs> but I, for me, the class is just good enough for everything. When I having a highly performant code that that I'm just taking care of performance, this will be the place that I will start thinking about using structs. Because structs are tricky. They are boxed, they have non-obvious behaviors, uh, defensive copies might be created, uh, they, the, the values may be passed by copy, so in fact the performance becomes worse than using just the class which are passed by reference. So in general using structs is kind of tricky, we will really need to understand what we are doing. So for me, Still, I will stay with classes and this small part of the, uh, our application, this 2-3% of our applications that we really want to tune, they will start about thinking uh, classes, uh, structs, still, even they be clear. Sometimes they seem to be faster, I show you that in that way, but then I could make a talk about why structs are slower in some scenarios. <laughs> so we should be really careful. We have probably one. Here was, there was a... And it is the last question because the time is out. Yeah, if you have any questions, I will be here around today, tomorrow, so feel free to ask. Can you please advise regarding the best uh, approach you can advise for the task of search uh, in strings? For example, you have a list or array of uh, classes, objects, and they have some string fields. So mm. for the task of search, string search, without using, I don't know, some special yes, uh, yes. third parties like Elasticsearch is pure .NET code. Yes. Uh, we can do here in many ways. Uh, probably I would go into the direction of using span of t, which will allow us to s interpret these uh, strings in slicing and find for these particular strings. And there is a great talk from Stephen Gordon, you can find it. He is describing how he applied uh, a span of t in parsing and finding elements in uh, JSONs, for example. So it will be like uh, direct answers, answer to your question, probably. Also, there is an ongoing work of using SIMD in, in Trini6 uh, code to interpret uh, hmm. to interpret, uh, to find uh, substrings in strings in a vectorized way thanks to SIMD instructions, which is a totally uh, brain exploding thing, let's say, but it is possible. So it will be the, mass, the most possible, the fastest way of uh, searching text with the help of that. I don't have links about that, but for sure you will find it in SIMD uh, text search algorithms for that exists. But it will be ultra specific, but also ultra fast. And you really want to do it fastly. Okay, so I believe we don't have any more time. If you have any more questions, I will be there here. Remember about the game and have a nice conference. Thank you.